So, um, hi, welcome. I'm Matt Ahrens. Um, Thanks for having me here uh, in the Netherlands. Um, if you have any questions, please just uh, interrupt me, raise your hand. Uh, if you don't want to interrupt me, and I'll call on you. Um, I'll, I'm here to talk about ZFS and OpenZFS. Um, we have plenty of time, so I thought I'd start with talking about some of the history of ZFS um, and how we got to where we are today. So um, back in 2001, um, I was a fresh college graduate. Um, I joined Sun, and um, together with Jeff Bonwick, we started working on ZFS. Um, it barely had a name at that point. Um, basically, uh, all that I knew fresh out of college was that I had the opportunity to work on a brand new file system. Um, so that's really great for somebody coming right out of college. Um, and to work on it with some really smart folks. So uh, we started in 2001 with the goal of ending the suffering of system administrators. Um, you know, we had seen uh, you know, all the problems that were caused by UFS and SVM, traditional file systems and volume managers, um, and you know, the, the kind of problems that it uh, foisted upon system administrators because software developers were not um, creating tools that were good enough. Um, so, about five years, four years into the um, development, we released the source code. Um, we put it into Solaris 10 Update 2 uh, in 2006, um, and people started really using it. So, file systems are really hard. Um, it's hard to make a file system, and people are really reluctant to put their production data on a new file system. I think rightly so, because, uh, you know, it, it's critical to your business, and if something goes wrong, um, it's not necessarily just a reboot, you know, you could lose all of your data. So um, we found that, you know, we released it in 2005, it was great, then we found all the problems, then we fixed them all, um, and then, uh, you know, then things are great. Uh, everything is perfect. So as part of the open sourcing effort, we saw a bunch of different communities pick up ZFS. So uh, one of the first ones was FreeBSD, um, and uh, FreeBSD is now one of the most mature uh, implementations of ZFS. Um, it's been in FreeBSD since FreeBSD 7. Um, the port to uh, Linux was also started around the same time, um, 2006, 2007. So in 2010, there was kind of this really interesting event that happened in the life of ZFS. Um, Oracle acquired Sun, and there were a lot of questions about what that would mean for ZFS and for open source and the future of ZFS. So uh, in terms of ZFS, you know, Oracle has continued to support ZFS very heavily in terms of their own implementation and, and you know, making improvements um, to the ZFS that's in their own products. But they haven't shared the source code um, with the community um, as Sun did. So this created some big questions about you know, what was the future of open source ZFS, like the ZFS that was in FreeBSD. Um, and uh, basically, uh, what happened is that the Illumis community was founded really as the truly open source successor to open, to open Solaris. So what do I mean by truly open source? So the Sun Open Solaris project was certainly open source in that the source code was available, but it wasn't really open development. Uh, so all the changes were controlled by Sun. There was really only one player in that community um, that was funding all the development uh, and pushing all of their own products. So in the Lumos community, there's a whole bunch of different players, um, all contributing, you know, source code, development expertise, products, um, you know, much more similar to other open source communities that you see like FreeBSD or Linux. Um, and we'll have some examples of companies doing, uh, doing that work uh, in a couple slides. Um, so just this year, um, ZFS on Linux uh, was released for uh, general use. Um, this is the in-kernel Linux implementation. Uh, so good performance, uh, good stability, 
uh, it's, I would say, you know, the, the third most stable um, implementation of ZFS. Um, and also this year, just a couple weeks ago, uh, we announced uh, the OpenZFS community, um, which I'll talk about in a moment. Any questions about this kind of history so far? So what's all this about OpenZFS? So OpenZFS is a community <coughs> product, a community project uh, founded by open source ZFS developers from a bunch of different operating systems. Um, so the real uh, point of this is to create kind of a meta community or a community of communities to bring together uh, people who are working on ZFS uh, who were previously not talking to one another very much. Um, so the goals of the, of the project, the OpenZFS project, are um, to raise awareness of ZFS, to make people um, like you guys uh, aware of the fact that ZFS exists, I think you already knew that, but uh, that it exists on all these different platforms, you know, uh, not just uh, Solaris, but Illumos, um, Linux, FreeBSD, um, and uh, a very um, early pre-alpha port to uh, macOS uh, by the, some um, open community developers. Um, also to encourage open <coughs> communication about the works that are going on to improve uh, ZFS, uh, open source ZFS, um, from all the different communities. So this is primarily about uh, getting developers to talk to one another. Um, and then uh, to ensure consistent uh, performance, reliability, functionality across all the different distributions. So uh, making sure that uh, when you use ZFS on Lumos and you use ZFS on Linux, you're getting the same high quality ZFS experience. So um, what are we doing to actually achieve these goals? Uh, we've created a web page, uh, open-zfs.org, um, and here, <laughs> and here you can find uh, all kinds of information about OpenZFS, documentation, uh, things like that. And we've created a platform independent mailing list. So this is primarily for developers to discuss and, re and review uh, <coughs> code and architecture changes to ZFS. So this isn't meant as a replacement for the existing, say, uh, Illumos, uh, ZFS at Illumos mailing lists. Um, this is mainly uh, a low, lower volume mailing list uh, for developers to coordinate activities. Um, talk about that in a minute. Uh, so, we, in terms of uh, creating a high quality uh, implementation of ZFS on all the platforms, we're working on creating cross platform test suites and reducing the code differences between platforms. Um, to increase communication, uh, we're also work, working on office hours. So, I'll be holding the first. Uh, Open ZFS office hours uh, next week. Um, this is open to anyone, developers, users, sysadmins, um, to call in. This will be uh, held um, on the internet live using some kind of audio, video, streaming technology that I haven't quite sorted out yet. Um, <laughs> but uh, we'll definitely announce it on the mailing list and on the website. So um, probably later this week, we'll have the announcement on open-zfs.org uh, of, of how to join the office hours and what time they'll be exactly. Uh, but the idea here is that um, the people hosting the office hours, it'll rotate. It'll be people, um, pe typically developers from uh, all the different communities. So you'll be able to ask, you know, the the lead uh, ZFS on Linux developer, you know, what, how is ZFS on Linux? Why should I use it? What buff, you know, what distribute, what Linux distros are carrying it? Those kinds of things. So I mentioned that. Um, OpenZFS is available on lots of different uh, platforms. Um, I'm curious if you guys, can I get a show of hands? Has anyone used ZFS on Mac OS X? Has anybody used it on Linux? A couple people. How about FreeBSD? Yeah? And anybody use it on Illumos? You got a smart OS shirt on, I'm guessing you. Cool. Um, and uh, how about on Solaris? Everybody, pretty much. <laughs> cool. Um, so uh, part of the strength of OpenZFS is the platform diversity. Um, and you know, that's kind of one of the reasons that we created it to begin with. Um, so there's a lot of activity going on on all these different platforms. You can see some of the numbers here. These are from the past 12 months. And you know, we've got um, over 100 um, contributors across all the platforms um, and hundreds and hundreds of, of commits. And that's enabled a bunch of companies to create businesses uh, based on uh, ZFS on these different platforms. So, you know, this includes uh, companies doing like storage appliances, um, like uh, Nacenta, uh, Spectrologic, IX Systems, um, 
but also companies doing you know more kind of varied uh, products. Uh, so, um, for example, join with their you know cloud offering, um, wheel systems with this security appliance. These are companies that um, where storage is not necessarily the core of their business, but it's a necessary component to make a larger product. Um, so, for example, wheel systems makes a security appliance um, where they um, it's like kind of like a VPN gateway where um, contractors or employees will uh, VPN in and then they record all the activities that they're doing so that if there's a problem, they can later uh, go back and replay those. They need to store all that information somewhere. They need to store it on ZFS. Any questions about um, this stuff so far? So next, I wanted to talk about um, what's cool about OpenZFS. Um, you know, what are all, the, all those commits, all that activity, um, what actual features are we adding? What's, what's new and better about ZFS? Um, so one of the first things that we realized when uh, the Lumos community started and uh, we realized that Sun was no, was no longer going to be the cent central bottleneck of all changes, um, there are going to be a lot of different companies uh, that would be making changes to ZFS, working on implementing new features, um, and we'd love for all those companies to work together, contribute their changes back, but we can't expect them to do that um, immediately. We can't expect them to develop, um, you know, to share their works in progress as they're working on it. So we realized that we needed something like feature flags. So, um, yeah. so initially, the Z in the ZFS development model, basically all the changes had to go through some. Uh, so we could get away with a linear on-disk version number. So if the software supported version 30, then it had to also know about version 29, 28, et cetera. Um, feature flags enables independent development of on-disk features uh, and then later allows those features that were independently developed to be combined into one code base. So uh, if uh, we're working on a new feature, say at Delphix, uh, we can um, say that this, this storage pool is using the you know, Delphix feature or whatever, and then um, at, if we later combine that into Lumos and other communities, then those pools will still know that they uh, support or that they use the on disk version of this uh, feature that we developed without conflicting with um, any other version. So in the old version, if you're developing new version, say 31, and someone else is also developing a new um, on disk feature, they would also call it 31, but they don't mean the same thing. So that works fine developed independently and shipping it just to your own customers, but it doesn't allow you to easily integrate those changes into a common code base, which is really what we want to encourage with OpenZFS. Um, so next I want to talk about a recent change. Um, so the feature flags went in about, I want to say two years ago. Um, so this is a, a pretty recent change that I worked on. Um, has anybody run into this problem where um, you're using ZFS really heavily for write? So you're pounding it with write, with write activity. And you find that everything's great. It's, it's servicing those writes really, really quickly until you fill up the uh, basically the cache of write of changes, and then everybody has to stop. It's just like everything's great, and then all of a sudden, all the writing threads have to are stuck, and they have to wait for several seconds where it flushes it out. So this is the kind of behavior that um, we see in this graph here. So this is on a logarithmic scale, showing um, a histogram of number of operations, and here the late the latency of each of these write operations. So this big um, spike here at the end. Um, shows hundreds of operations that needed to wait four seconds or more um, to be serviced. And the reason that, that something like this has to happen is because you know, we take in uh, those write chains from the application, we have ZFS um, hold, buffers them, holds onto them, and then writes them out to disk. Well, if the disk can't service the changes, it can't perform those writes as quickly as the application sends them to us, then at some point, somebody has to wait. So in traditional file systems, what, uh, what might happen is that um, as each write operation from the application comes in, the write was synchronously done to the disk. And, and um, so every write operation had kind of a minimum bar of taking, you know, say a few milliseconds to go uh, write that to the disk. With ZFS, since we're buffering those changes, um, most operations per go really quickly, uh, which is great. Um, that's, of course, assuming that they're asynchronous operations that the application hasn't requested 
that the writes go to stable storage. But then we have this artifact of the implementation where we have these really, really long uh, bubbles. So um, I implemented uh, an algorithm in ZFS to smooth out this write latency. Uh, basically, as the amount of dirty data in the system uh, accumulates, um, we service the writes really quickly until uh, the, the amount of dirty data is partly full. When it's about halfway full, then we start uh, delaying each write operation just a little bit. And then as we get more and more full, we delay each write operation more and more and more. Um, so this allows the uh, delay to find kind of a natural resting point. Um, so what, when you have a stream of writes coming in uh, at kind of an even pace, uh, then the, uh, over, the latency delay will kind of reach a consistent value. And if the operation, if the write re requests are um, are coming in slower than the disk can uh, write, if the disk can service the write requests as quickly as the um, operations are coming in, then you'll still see that very quick write latency that um, we see uh, with ZFS uh, normally. So um, the kind of end results here are that the outliers um, before were about 10 seconds. Um, now, uh, with the new changes, it's about 30 milliseconds. So outliers in this case means that 99.99% of all of the writes took less than this amount of time. Um, and uh, so the goal of this was not really to improve overall throughput, but rather to smooth out the latency seen by the application to improve application responsiveness. Um, but we actually got a little bit of um, absolute performance speed up here from about 5,600 to 5,900 um, IOPS on this particular test case. Is, is there any um, notion of rights per application, or is this just system-wide? This is system-wide. Um, so uh, there isn't really any uh, explicit uh, QoS um, management in the ZFS layer. Um, there's actually some interesting work uh, that's been done by Joyant. Um, which uh, they're, we're kind of talking with them about um, getting that into ZFS in a way that everybody can use. Um, they, the way that they did it was uh, per zone, um, so that's kind of how they defined the application. Um, that works really well for if you have zones, and if you don't, then it doesn't work at all. So um, I think that's something that, we'd be look, that we would look at getting into kind of in, in its current form, but also looking at how that could be extended to uh, both to work like in um, FreeBSD jails, which are kind of a similar concept to Solaris zones, but also to be able to, to more flexibly define like these applications are in one um, I.O. group or something like that. Yes. At the same time, this looks like you've uh, slowed down, or if it, as if you've increased the median uh, response time on a write by almost two orders of magnitude. So um, we've actually, well, we have decreased the average write time um, because the IOPS has gone, the number of IOPS per second has gone up, um, and we have the same number of threads in both cases. Um, it's certainly true that in the former case, most writes were serviced extremely quickly down here in the you know, microseconds bucket, versus with the new code, most writes are serviced in about one millisecond. Um, so, so it probably is true that the median um, has gone up, uh, but the difference is that with the old scheme, you get those a bunch of writes being serviced very, very quickly, and then no writes being serviced at all for several seconds. Um, so this is that kind of behavior is much worse for um, application responsiveness. Now, that's it's not necessarily worse if you're just doing a lot of writes, and that's only you only have one uh, application that's doing writes. Um, and you're just waiting until the whole thing finishes. But if you're doing anything where there's multiple applications, multiple streams of writes going on, uh, then this is extremely bad and very noticeable. I mean, even from the command line, if you have one application that's writing stuff, and then you type, you know, echo hello world into some file, you know, that's going to sit there for several seconds. As opposed to with the new code, it will only take, you know, a couple of milliseconds. Basically, basically you're applying Little's law by. Uh, limiting the amount of work in progress, you basically improve the total throughput. Yeah, yeah. And the, uh, and the typical response. Time. Yeah, so um, it, there's a bunch of kind of similar algorithms and like networking, leaky bucket, yeah, all, all TCP, all this kind of stuff. 
Um, the problem here is slightly different, um, and the kind of uh, the way that we do this control exactly in terms of finding the balance um, is a little is you know specific to this use case, but it's same same overall idea. It's it's basically queuing. Yeah. Um, so another thing uh, that we did in OpenZFS so was introduced LZ4 compression. So this is a new compression algorithm. Uh, it improves on the previous default, uh, which was LZJV, um, both in terms of compression speed, decompression speed, especially decompression speed, and a little bit in um, uh, compression amount. Um, so these numbers are for a single thread. Um, so you can see that we can decompress a single thread or single core can decompress now um, about twice as quickly. Uh, with LZ4 as with uh, the previous LZJV. Um, through in GZIP here for comparison, GZIP is, is much, much slower, especially at compression, um, and gets a little bit better compression ratio. ZFS also supports um, GZIP compression. All right, so now um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, a project that's in progress. Uh, this is being developed at Delphix. Um, so has, it, has anybody here used ZFS send and receive, say for remote replication or taking backups? Cool. So um, maybe I'll, we have some time. I think I'll kind of tell you a little bit about how um, send and receive uh, was implemented to begin with. So back in 2004 or the beginning of 2005, um, I was actually, uh, we were working on finishing up ZFS uh, it was almost done, everything, you know, we were good to go, and uh, I was working in China on an engineering rotation there. So we had opened an office in China. Um, I was working on helping some of the uh, QA engineers there come up to speed on ZFS. And um, I was also working on my day job on, on you know, implementing ZFS. And I found that um, doing development was very tedious in China because the ancient, ancient, um, source code management system uh, used NFS. Uh, this is Teamware for any of you that are familiar with it. Yeah. So Teamware used uh, NFS to do all of its communication. So uh, I would be sitting in China, I would say I'd like to pull over the changes that everybody in Menlo Park has made. And uh, I would say, that's great. Let me go over NFS, traverse this directory tree with hundreds of thousands of files over NFS, over a really, really slow, um, re uh, in both in terms of high latency and low bandwidth uh, linked to America. So this would take like hours just to pull over the changes. And I saw, you know, there's only like, you know, 100 files were changed, but it still takes hours. It doesn't matter how many files were changed, it has to go look at all of them. There's got to be a better way to just see, you know, what was, see what the changes were and send those changes over. So uh, that's kind of where I got the idea for ZFS send and receive. So using the metadata in ZFS, we can quickly do an incremental uh, send uh, because we can quickly find which blocks were changed. So unlike something like rsync, where um, it, rsync only needs to send the blocks that were changed, but it has to traverse all the files to figure out which blocks are changed. And uh, if you have files that are par partially changed, like say database files, then it, um, it has to read all the entire file on both sides to figure out which blocks were changed to only send those over the wire. With ZFS, we have all this metadata about exactly which blocks are changed that we can find very quickly uh, by traversing the tree of blocks and uh, only traversing the parts of the tree that have changes underneath them. Um, so that was great. I mean, Z so uh, with like less than a year before we, um, we, we shipped ZFS, we came up with this great idea, was able to implement it. But there's been a problem with it since day one, which is that if you're in the middle of a ZFS send and uh, the network goes down or one of the machines reboots, then you have to start that send all the way over from the beginning. Um, and this really sucks if you're sending like a five terabyte stream and you're 4.5 terabytes done uh, and then the network dies uh, and you have to restart all over from the beginning. Um, so uh, what we're working on is resumable send and receive. Um, the idea is that uh, the receiver is going to remember how far it's gotten, and then it can tell the sender, uh, I've gotten this far, please restart sending from that point. Um, another cool thing that uh, is actually in OpenZFS today is ZFS send progress reporting. So another problem with that ZFS send had from the beginning was that if you're doing an incremental send, 
um, there's no way to figure out how big is this going to be. So you start the send and you hope that it completes in an hour and then it doesn't. So then you hope that it completes overnight and you come back the next morning and maybe it hasn't. And you really don't know. Um, so we uh, implemented uh, ZFS send um, size estimation so it can tell you I'm going to send this stream and it's going to be approximately this many gigabytes. Um, and then also progress, mo progress monitoring. So um, with ZFS send uh, dash V for verbose, it will print out um, every second how, how, uh, how much has been sent um, and then so you can know how much uh, is left to send and figure out how, how long that's going to take. So does ZFS send actually transmit blocks in the order of the transaction group? Or? No, so um, the way ZFS send works is it, tra it traverses the tree of blocks. So basically it's going to um, look, you can think of it as looking at each object in object number order and then looking at each block of that object in the you know, logical order within that block. Um, with the exception that it's able to skip over um, any ranges that where there were no changes. Um, so if there were no changes in object number 100, then it can just skip over to the next object. If there are no changes in objects 100 through 500, they can skip over that whole chunk um, you know, in constant time without having to look at every single object. Um, so this bookmark, it, it basically tells you what object and which offset. Where am I in the tree? Exactly, exactly. Um, so um, some of the kind of tr little bit trickier parts of this are the fact that um, we need to make sure that the sender and the receiver agree about where they're starting from so that the user can't shoot themselves in the foot by sending from the wrong point. Um, and also, um, currently the send stream is checksum, but the checksum is only uh, sent at the very end of the stream. So after we've received the whole stream, we, we can see, oh, was that uh, transmitted faithfully or not? And if it wasn't, then we say, oh, sorry, it didn't work. But um, we, with the progress monitoring, that doesn't work because you could have half the stream sent, and then you start from there, you get to the end of the new stream, but you won't know if that first part of the stream was actually sent faithfully. So um, now we'll be sending uh, checksums after every record or every few records. Any more questions about send and receive or any of this new stuff. Yeah. Will, are you planning on any native uh, network connections in send receive? Because piping it uh, either through SSH or, or NetCat <laughs> really sucks. Yeah. Um, we're not, uh, we don't really have anything in the works for that. Um, I think that uh, it sucks in terms of performance. Is, is that your experience? Yeah. So I don't think that we want to, um, oh, I don't know of anybody who's working on end-to-end um, -end open source solution in terms of network, you know, doing that whole networking stack. I mean, that often is very dependent on the rest of the infrastructure that you're using. You know, should you use SSH, should you use Netcat, how do you manage the keys, all this kind of stuff. Um, the one thing that I would really like to see though uh, is um, buffering built into the ZFS send and receive, which would improve the performance um, regardless of what the underlying transport is, so that you can do things like ZFS send, pipe, SSH, pipe, ZFS receive. So we've, had, we've seen a lot of performance gains just by um, inserting another thread that's buffering those changes. The issue is that there just aren't, uh, like when, this, when you're sending, we read the data from the kernel and then send it over the wire using one thread. So um, the buffers in all those cases are not nearly big enough to kind of smooth out the reads from the disk. Um, so you might you know, get 64K from the kernel and then send it over the network and the network says, great, um, I'm gonna send that 64K, uh, but you know, who knows how slow the network is? You know, that takes some time and if the kernel has already read stuff from disk and now it's waiting, it's trying to send it out to the user land, but user land hasn't come back and asked for it, then uh, the kernel can't make additional forward progress setting those reads off the disk. So we don't get nearly as much um, concurrent uh, reads and write activity as we could. Um, but if the network is slow, then it, there's a least of the problems, I mean. Sure, if the network is slow, then the, the best you can hope. It's with the fast network. Yeah, it's with the fast network that you run into, that 
uh, we are not utilizing that fast network as well as we could. Yeah. Um, and that's where this additional buffering um, can give some performance improvements. You would like uh, to get some parallelization, some parallel streams. I wonder how that fits into so, the idea of walking that tree. So there's kind of parallel streams brings two ideas to my mind. One is that um, we want the send, the ZFS send, uh, to be issuing a lot of IOs to the disk concurrently so that we can keep all the disks busy reading the data off. Yeah. Um, but the other, and uh, that's, you know, that is already the case with ZFS send. We just need to kind of unleash it a little bit by um, uh, removing this uh, bottleneck with the network or interlock, un unnecessary interlock with the, with the network. But the other one is um, actually using multiple TCP streams. So, you know, this is an area where it's like, it is clearly not part of like ZFS's charter um, to figure out what the next great networking protocol should be. Um, but it is actually something that we're working on at Delphix for our replication product. Um, so um, we're working on a new networking protocol um, called DSP for Delphix session protocol. Um, and it allows you to, for example, take the output from one stream from ZFSN and split it over multiple TCP connections so that the, those can be multiplexed over um, you know, multiple links. Uh, you can use you know, multiple CPUs to, do the, to, do the network, to run the networking stack. Um, and this is something that, we're, uh, that we'll also be working on open sourcing uh, as, as separate from ZFS project. Was, was there another hand in the back? Yeah. Um, the format of the stream for ZFS uh, 10, uh, did you have to change that to incorporate bookmarks? Um, yes, we uh, we will be changing it to incorporate bookmarks. So, uh, one of the principles of ZFS is to make uh, the compatibility of things very explicit. So, for example, with explicit uh, Z pool upgrades to, to uh, enable new features to be used by the on disk format, and having uh, new uh, new ZFS software releases always be able to read and write. Um, to old ZFS pools, even going back all the way to 2005 version one. Um, and the same applies to the send stream. So for example, um, when we added uh, um, deduplication to the send stream, um, that only applies when you use the option, when you explicitly request it. So if you do ZFS send dash capital D, it does deduplication on the send stream. Um, and the receiver needs to also know about how to handle that. Um, but we don't do that unless it's requested by the sender. So the same is gonna apply here, where um, the sender will, you'll have to specify a special flag to ZFS send to, to enable this behavior um, because of the new uh, on-disk uh, or over-the-wire um, format. Any more questions? So um, currently, uh, the way that uh, OpenZFS is being developed is that uh, each platform has their own um, code base, their own uh, source code repositories, um, and changes are pulled and pushed <coughs> between these different platforms in an ad hoc basis. <coughs> so uh, for example, um, right now, uh, Illumos is kind of most active in terms of adding new, uh, where f new features are added. Um, and then FreeBSD is very, uh, very quick about pulling those changes down from Illumos into FreeBSD. Um, you know, Linux, there's a lot of activity going on, mainly uh, around Linux specific um, features and uh, increasing compatibility with uh, Linux. Um, and you know, they, have, uh, they pull changes um, a little bit more sporadically uh, from Illumos. Um, in both of these platforms, there's uh, new uh, features being added, but only rarely um, pushed up to Linux and rarely shared uh, between, say, uh, Linux and FreeBSD. So with OpenZFS, uh, we like to um, simplify this uh, activity of getting ZFS changes onto every platform. So our idea for this is to create a platform-independent code base. Um, so the idea would be that uh, the code which is act, which is truly platform independent would live in this uh, platform independent code, rep code repository 
and all the platforms would be able to pull changes from this repository verbatim without having any uh, differences on their particular platform. And then uh, platform independent changes would be pushed here to this independent platform independent code base first, um, and then pulled down into each uh, distribution. So uh, the the goal here is both to um, simplify this process and also to um, kind of clean up a little bit of the mess uh, that there is on FreeBSD and Linux with their Solaris porting layer, which is what the SPL is. So they've created a porting layer basically to uh, emulate some of the interfaces that exist in Illumos, um, which is a little bit tricky in some cases. So for example, if you have a function whose name is the same on in Illumos and uh, FreeBSD, but which has different meaning or takes different arguments, then you have to do really gross hacks with the uh, C preprocessor um, to get things to compile. Um, so uh, this will allow us to kind of create a common um, compilation environment. So basically, uh, the code that's in this common repo will only use uh, defined interfaces that we know we can implement on every platform. So how do we figure out like what the development model is for this mode base? Um, the, the key thing is that we can only um, put code in here that we can test on any platform and be sure that it will work properly on every platform. Because we don't want to make um, people who are familiar with Linux uh, figure out how to compile and test their changes on FreeBSD and Mac OS and, and Lumos, for example. So uh, we're going to do that by uh, creating a um, user land implementation of ZFS uh, that would run um, on every platform uh, just using the POSIX interfaces um, that applications have available to them. And then we'll be able to test that with both ZTest and the test suite uh, that was developed uh, originally at Sun in the STF framework. Um, so this code will not include the ZPL, which is the POSIX layer the very kind of topmost part of ZFS that implements uh, things like file ownership um, and groups and permissions uh, because those interfaces are very different on every platform. Any questions about this? I don't know, how many other, how many developers are, in the, are there in the audience? All right, a couple. So at least a few people hopefully understood what I was talking about. <laughs> um, so I think, all right, great. So um, I'll come back to this one um, as we have time later. Um, so how can you get involved in OpenZFS? If you're making a product uh, with OpenZFS, then let us know. Um, we'd love to talk with you, coordinate um, activities, uh, talk to you about how OpenZFS is going to make your product even better. Um, get your logo on our website and on the back of our t-shirts. Um, tell your customers that you're using OpenZFS. Um, if, you're, uh, open, if you're a user or a system administrator, um, we'd love to enlist you to help spread the word about OpenZFS, uh, that it's great, that development is continuing, um, that Oracle does not own all the development of ZFS, um, and that ZFS, OpenZFS is available on lots of platforms. Um, we also we have a documentation wiki on open-zfs.org. Um, right now, it's largely a... a collection of links to other documentation, plus uh, some new uh, documentation that we've written that's specifically for for ZFS developers, uh, some kind of walk, code walkthroughs of what happens at different layers in ZFS. Yes. Matt, what, when you say OpenZFS, are you including, you know, somebody's, for example, pulling the Illumos code today, would you say they're using OpenZFS? Yeah, okay. absolutely. Um, so, yeah, what we mean here about OpenZFS is kind of the umbrella uh, organization which encompasses everyone who's using open source ZFS. Um, so this is a little bit of kind of uh, <coughs> naming things after the fact, right? Where you know we started working on open source on ZFS open source and you know Illumos breaking away from Sun like you know three years ago, um, and just now we're kind of creating this name and also creating uh, this uh, shared community between. All, all these different uh, existing platforms. Um, so 
maybe someday once we have this um, you know new development model, then uh, you know maybe there will be, it will make sense to have a distinction between uh, platforms that are using this development model versus their own you know the, the current one. But our hope is that um, we'll be able to get all the platforms on board with this, and there will be no real distinctions. Um, if you're writing code, then um, please join the developer uh, at open-zfs.org mailing list. Um, you can post on here, get design help or feedback on code changes. Um, take a look at the project ideas if you're looking for um, things to work on or wondering what other people are working on. So that's kind of all, the main part that I have for the prepared slides. I don't know how we are on time, but I'm happy to talk about kind of anything else. Um, so um, there's a whole bunch of features that we are working on um, in OpenZFS. People are working on various different platforms. Uh, happy to talk about any of those or um, take questions on them. Um, there's also a whole bunch of features that are already in OpenZFS that are unique to OpenZFS um, and not part of any closed source ZFS implementations. Um, happy to tell you about more of those. Um, lots of performance improvements. Uh, this is developer oriented stuff. So, maybe we could do that after. Right? Yeah, sure. <coughs> Sounds like a nice self contained piece to do after yeah. the break. Yeah. Okay. So, let's have a breakdown. Yes. All right. <laughs> Thanks for now.